Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff on the Mully and Haw Show on 670 The Score. Dan Wieters from the Chicago Tribune. He's down in Orlando and Orlando at the NFL owners meetings. It's been a very busy day at the NFL owners meetings in terms of rules changes, in terms of a lot of conversation. Dan, I think you've had a whirlwind 48 hours down yeah. there. A lot of information flying around. Yeah, you're not kidding. The last yeah 52 hours or so, it felt like a blur. I was just talking to my colleague Colleen Kane from the Tribune and just discussing about how fun this event is, but how it's nonstop, honestly, for, for, for two and a half days as you're dealing with so many different developing stories and rules changes and things with the Bears and getting opportunities to, to speak exclusively in one-on-one -on -one settings with the chairman of the Bears, the team president of the Bears, the general manager of the Bears, the coach of the Bears. And so you, you kind of have to sift through all that flood of information and try to take a breath at the end of the day and figure out what all you learned. And I feel like at this time, in Bears history, it's never been busier and never been more uh, interesting in a lot of different ways. We had a good recap of Ryan Poles talking on day one of the owners meetings in terms of what he did to trade Justin Fields, how difficult that was, and then the impressions from Caleb Williams. And then day two, we heard from Matt Eberflus on Caleb Williams, among other things, and the defensive secondary getting together. We'll get to that. But I thought the most significant thing, big picture wise, in this offseason where both on the field and off the field stories are competing for, uh, I think, what is the biggest, trying to be, you know, take the, the the biggest headline away. Kevin Warren talking about the next phase of the Bears stadium project and really doubling down uh, how the Bears are focused on the lakefront and making it sound like if this is indeed a leverage play, it is a loud one. <laughs> and it's very convincing because Kevin Warren was emphatic about focusing on the lakefront, Dan, and you were there. What was your overall impression? Yeah, and if it's a leverage play, it's one of the most elaborate orchestrated leverage plays in the history of leverage plays. And it just feels like the momentum has shifted, again, in talking to not only representatives from the Bears, but others around the league. A chance to visit with Mark Wilf, on the, who's the chair of the Vikings. Uh, of, he's the owner of the Vikings and the chair of the NFL Stadium Committee. Uh, having a chance to talk to Jerry Jones of the Cowboys, you you feel kind of the energy that that Kevin has presented and George has presented toward the possibility of of keeping the Bears Stadium on the lakefront, of developing the museum campus into a 365 day a year destination, of trying to create this think big vision that not only helps the Chicago Bears but enlivens the community of Chicago, the business community of Chicago, the culture of Chicago. It's a grand ambition that they have now, David. Listen, like. There's a lot of follow-up questions that are needed. There are a lot of things that need to be reported out. There are a lot of things that still need to be explained. But don't be surprised if before the middle of April, we have a grand unveiling by the Chicago Bears of renderings of videos with, with you know, brochure-like narratives and narration that, that give you an idea of what this vision for the lakefront is. And then we'll just kind of have to see how it all uh, fluidly evolves from there. But they certainly seem like they have momentum built on the lakefront and focus put on the lakefront, which puts Arlington Heights on the back burner. Which makes you wonder about a timetable, which makes you wonder about when we're going to see the renderings and a lot of the other details, which makes you wonder ultimately when they will put the first shovel into the That's ground it. and start the project. And Kevin Warren addressed that possibility when asked directly about it. Just to be clear on the stadium, if everything comes together, yes. if you guys have said the focus is now the lakefront, yep. everything comes together, all the obstacles, the money, the plan is to put a shovel on the ground on the lakefront, or does Arlington Heights get a chance to come um, back? And the the, the plan would be to put a shovel on the ground on the lakefront. That's stating it very unequivocally that the Bears have those plans and designs. And, and Dan, I, I, again, last week the context was Arlington Heights and the school districts had come, come to a co compromised position, and they had done that. The previous week, we just became aware of it days later. Uh, so the Bears were aware of that. Behind the scenes in Arlington Heights, officials still insist that they are, con are communicating with and negotiating with the Bears in good faith. Hearing Kevin Warren say that what we just heard doesn't sound like the Arlington Heights project, the acres that they own, is a priority at all. Well, when you listen to the Bears representatives talk about it, there, there hasn't been – um, a very detailed plan presented by the suburban project people that, 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 you know, advance the negotiations in a way that would cause the bears to, 
do that Sigma pivot back towards Arlington Heights and away from the city. And so um, there's a lot that goes into this stuff. And we said from the get go that, that people that were going to be observing this from afar needed to buckle their seatbelts because it is a bit of a roller coaster and there are a lot of twists and turns um, and things that are just part of the process. But then there's also things that that push you in a new direction. It feels like the Bears are pushed in a new direction right now. My colleague Colleen Kane has a very detailed story up at chicagotribune.com right now um, that talks about the things that the Bears were emphasizing here in Orlando this week in terms of their plans to try to push forward with a vision for a city site. And so it, it's worth revisiting that. And then obviously, again, following up, um, which we'll do with our reporting in, in the weeks ahead to, to get an idea of, of where this is headed, why it's headed that way, and what might be the obstacles to keep it from getting there. Uh, but again, w- when you listen to Kevin Warren, when you talk to George McCaskey, you just you, you hear some unity in the idea that, that look, like there is uh, something here to seriously explore, and they're in the process of seriously exploring that. It's part of what they're seriously exploring, according to reports. Last Thursday night, there was a meeting. We've talked about Kevin Warren and the Friends of the Parks, and in that meeting, apparently, these details were addressed. A sports museum, that's part of the project. A hotel, that is not necessarily a deal breaker, but is part of the grand plan. A pedestrian walkway uh, to Northerly Island. Uh, an underground parking uh, that would be available under Soldier Field, where Soldier Field is now. And then, of course, the new domed stadium, which would be where the south lot is now. Dan, I, I'm not surprised at the ambition and why... Kevin Warren has articulated the, the, the desire to stay in Chicago, a city that he clearly loves, and said, God, God kissed the lakefront. <laughs> What's a little surprising for people that have been around this for a long time, George McCaskey going in this direction, I wonder, did he need to be persuaded or what he really feels? Because they do own the land in Arlington Heights. They're not property flippers. How did he address some of those questions today? Well, I'll spin that a little bit to a bigger picture um, conversation about the culture change that's gone on at House Hall in the last year since Kevin Warren took over as team president. And George has described Kevin as a force of nature. And obviously, Kevin has made drastic changes, whether it's removing people that have been in the building for a a long time, whether it's bringing in new people and expanding the executive branch of of the things that they do upstairs in the front office at House Hall, whether it's taking on the the you know the the driver's seat role of of steering the stadium project kevin does things in a way that are unusual to the way things have been done by the chicago bears for a long time and george says that he's had to um adjust and be very willing to adjust with full trust in kevin that he's going to steer them in the right direction because that is why they hired him to begin with and so i think this is all part of that um you know process of 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 acclimating to uh, the new sheriff in town, so to speak, and 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 just having that sense of of look like things are going to be done in ways that um, challenge us to to think differently, to think bigger, to be more imaginative, and I think that's part of the, this process. If that uh, if that clarifies anything there, and, and I'm happy to take a follow up just as we kind of sort through George's thoughts from today. Yeah, I think so because it it, uh, it it's not surprising that Kevin Warren. Uh, I, I think the only thing surprising about his tack was that it was as strong as it was. He did not really leave much of a, a of a door the door open much to Arlington Heights or so it seemed. But um yeah George's role in this is, is going to be something interesting. What what was the the other thing you wanted to add about the Yeah I was just project? gonna say well and Colleen Kane had the um privilege and the honor to be the Chicago representative asking Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL, about the Bears Stadium right. project on Tuesday afternoon and his response was essentially that he had been in touch with Mayor Brandon Johnson of Chicago, which is a, a, a at least notable nugget on this whole thing where um, now you have the league, you know, not steering the Bears in any particular direction, but certainly keeping an eye on things and willing to be a resource and and willing to, um, you know, help clarify this vision and try to figure out what what's most feasible for all parties involved. That's the league. That's the club. That's the community. Uh, and so, yeah, this will be ongoing. But it's, it's something you said a little bit ago about getting the shovel in the ground, you know, the, the, the league norm is you put a shovel in the ground and you've got a new building open and ready for use in three years. Well, you know, that clock is ticking and Kevin has, has given us his own estimates that it's, you know, upwards of $200 million a year in costs, the further you delay this. And so this isn't just, Hey, let's explore things because time is of the essence here. And there is an hourglass that's losing sand every single day. And so the bears have to start to uh, push forward with, uh, with some direction in a way where a lot of the questions that you and I are talking about right now have answers 
and not just a ton of follow-up questions. Last thing I have on the stadium before we move on, if we can. So the story a couple of weeks ago was that the Bears were going to commit $2 billion of their own money to this project for a publicly owned private, publicly owned stadium. Uh, the, the report about the Friends of the Parks meeting included a, a somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollar in infrastructure. So that's three billion dollars in terms of the, the total size of the project. If you look at the Bears, two billion and then the one billion in infrastructure, chances are that price tag will continue to go up. It's kind of funny money to talk about right now because it's all conceptual. But in the Bears thinking, do you believe that? that billion dollars in infrastructure needs that they that this would identify would come from the government or public subsidies and then their two billion would pay for the rest and it's three billion too small to allocate for this project yeah i have no idea and those are some economic questions that, that i need to do further research on and try to get a better understanding of of where everything is i do think that there is going to be some partnerships within relationships that the bears are trying to create and and foster that will help them down that road but even just talking about the infrastructure money needed, not to mention just the the um, gravity of the infrastructure changes that would be needed to make something like this work in the way they want it to work, because their whole point is if you're going to do this, do it right. Well, man, those seem like some pretty high hurdles to clear. You might need an Olympic pole vaulter to get over some of these bars that they're, that they're setting for themselves. But uh, certainly they're going to look into it um, and we'll see where it all goes again. Like this is going to be a fluid story for for much of 2024 and then hopefully uh you and i get to the the, the year-end review of 2024 for the chicago bears which by the way will be a seven-part episode for this particular year in bears history and we'll look back and go wow can you imagine and believe all the things that we that we went through to get from point a to point z george bukaski did say something i thought was worth noting for those of us who have pointed out how incongruous this feels like or seems because the bears got into this in the first place because they wanted to own their own stadium which they can do in arlington heights which they won't do if it's the lakefront he made it clear that there are ways that you can structure the deal so it is equivalent essentially they would get the same profit return or the same type of dynamic would be in place I think that's a little bit of fuzzy math. I think I'd have to see some of the details. It also sounds like a, a way to justify staying uh, in Chicago and going this direction. They still would have a, a landlord. They would still be the tenant. I think when you want to own your own stadium, you are the landlord. You are yeah. an owner. And I think that's still appealing. But he did reference the fact that they structured the deal that would be and essentially have the owned stadium that they play in. Well, eventually, the, you know, their assurances, David, have to be backed by details. And I think that's some of what's lacking right now, which creates the confusion that we all have to sift through is, is you can't just tell us, oh, we got it. You know, we've got it figured out. Eventually, details need to be uh, behind this. And, and I think over time, we'll get some more of those. And when we don't, you know, it's uh, imperative that more questions are asked and we try to get a, a better feel for where this is headed. I, I I will say that, look, like when, when Kevin was hired and we talked a lot about this over the last year, you know, like the, the relentless energy and ambition that he brings is going to be felt in all the biggest projects that he does. This is a prime example of it where it's challenging the entire organization to think in a way that they've never thought before. And I think that grand vision is a good thing for this organization. We've lived through the non-grand vision for a long time and said, man, wh why don't they try to do better? Why don't they try to do bigger? Why don't they try to do more? This is an attempt to do that. Whether they get there or not, we'll see. But I do think some of these big swings that they're taking um, are are worth taking. And I also think that when when you kind of pair that with stuff that's going on on the football side and you, and you listen to not only the vision of Kevin Warren and Ryan polls, but you, you listen to their methodology and the way they go about things. You, you can't help but feel like they're in good hands right now. It's a very pivotal time in the organization's history. And it just feels like there, there's a chance here with the leadership and the vision that they have to make good on a pivotal time in franchise history, which hasn't always been the case here. All right, let's get to some of that football stuff because I think that's very interesting. Let's start with the fact that it was announced today as you previewed a long time ago that the bears will play in the hall of fame game august 1st in canton ohio against the houston texans in the same weekend that uh we were going to see Devin hester and steve mcmichael inducted into the pro football hall of fame 
the Bears will play the first game of the season in the exhibition season against the Texans. As I kidded, kidded people, kidded <laughs> this morning on Mullion Haw, Caleb Williams will begin his career in the spot that a lot of people expect him to end it, Canton, Ohio, on the footsteps uh, of the, the Hall of Fame. So I think that's a really interesting development, Dan. I don't know if Caleb Williams would even play in that game if he is indeed the quarterback of the first overall pick. But well done. You predi predicted this one a few weeks ago. Yeah, well, it, you know, it just felt like a natural fit when you've got two Bears legends plus uh, another guy who spent four of his 17 seasons uh, in Julius Peppers going into the Hall of Fame in a certain summer. It certainly makes perfect business sense to invite Chicago to Canton, Ohio, on that first week in August and say, hey, have your party here. You know, and, and I, you know, I told you on the Mully and Haw show earlier this morning that that should be a, a really, really fun few days for those who are able to make it to Canton, Ohio. I mean, I, I can't think of, of, of something where there would be that much um, energy attached to the Chicago Bears when you're celebrating the career of Steve McMichael, particularly given his physical state in his battle with ALS, when you're celebrating the achievements of Devin Hester, when you are introducing the number one overall pick to the NFL world, when, when you've got this team that seems like it's positioned to, to really make a leap forward in 2024, the energy in Canton, Ohio in those few days is going to be massive. Um, the other part that goes with this, David, it's not good for me and it causes some issues for the, the Chicago Bears as a team themselves is it, it forces you to report to training camp earlier. And so Matt Eberflus is having to make revisions to not only the training camp schedule, but the off season program. And he, he told us today at the coaches breakfast that he's going to move the mandatory mini camp up before the third session of OTA. So you'll have two weeks of OTAs, then the mandatory mini camp, and then the third session of OTAs. That's significant only because those OTAs are voluntary. And this would allow those veteran players who want a little bit more time before they report to training camp to take a little more time. And then you have to juggle the preseason now where the bears will have four preseason games, three of them away from Chicago. And so you've got to, you've got to set yourself up for success during that period with, with scheduling and, you know, figuring out how you're going to handle all this. Um, and, you know, you referenced it. Would Caleb Williams, if he is a Chicago Bear, even play in that game? I don't know. You know, I don't know what the what the strategy and the sports science and everything else will tell us when we get to that point. But um, certainly will be a, a, a fun time. And, and maybe we can go do a Take the North pod from the front steps of the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame. I think that would be really cool. Uh, I think maybe they could figure out some time uh, of timetable, maybe when they – host Caleb Williams the first week in April. Next week, he apparently will be at yeah. Hallis Hall. That was discussed on Tuesday morning when you guys had your sit down and the breakfast with Flusie, if you will. Hey, but by the way, was Flusie wearing a Marquette shirt? Because I know they're still alive in the in the brackets. <laughs> did, he, did he have he, a Marquette? He was not. He had some okay. sort of collared woven, uh, it was like a long sleeve collared woven shirt there. The the, the Flusie glow up, uh, as they're calling it here in NFL circles, was discussed at the breakfast this morning. He said that his wife, Kelly, was the, the brains behind it. His daughter's Grace and Giada helped contribute, and he said initially his wife's been pushing him to grow this beard for a while. I know this is the pressing news that you've been waiting for all day, and he said he didn't want to do it. He grew it for a week. It was itchy. He begged to shave it. She said, just keep it, and then the itch went away, and now we've got new look flus for the rest of 2024. How did the itch go away? That's something I didn't understand. <laughs> what happened? Did it change, like, uh, shampoo? That, I don't understand. You just get used to it. You know, the whiskers, the whiskers become actual beard, and then and then you're good to go. I guess he did. He did, in fact, though, talk about Caleb Williams, the way Ryan Poles did a day earlier, and they were still dazzled by the pro day and just that experience in Southern California when they were there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three nights uh, in L.A., which one day I think will be a documentary on 19 football, 1920 football drive. Um, but this is what Matt Eberflus had to say when the subject of Caleb Williams came up at the owners' meetings. It was great. Uh, the, the biggest takeaway is that uh, you can see the arm talent uh, on the film and you can see it there in, in, or in person. And that was the biggest takeaway. Um, what I loved to see was that uh, the interaction with the other players. Um, you can see that. And, you know, we talked to every every person that was on that team. You know, at the Senior Bowl, we interviewed them. We interviewed them at the, uh, at the Pro Day. We talked to those guys at the dinner. And you can see certainly see that those players uh, love uh, love him and respect him and, uh, and what he's brought to that program. So very much uh, the same idea that Ryan Poles talked about. He, they, I think, got the biggest impression. They, they kind of felt good about the player, 
but they feel even better now about the person. And a lot of that is based on seeing him interact with teammates and seeing him firsthand deal with the Bears in what I felt like was described as a very mature professional way. Right. And, you know, Ryan Poles made reference to the fact that when they were out at the Bird Street Club in West Hollywood and they were having that that first night with Caleb Williams and a few of his teammates out that that someone on his staff elbowed him and said, look, like he the kid hasn't taken his phone out at any point during our visit here, which left an impression that, you know, this is um, a, a young man who's very intentional about what he is immersed in, um, in that in that instance, it's building a relationship with the Chicago Bears. It's um, showing them how serious he is about being great. Um, and and I, I think they're drawn to that. I think that, as I told you from the combine uh, earlier this month or late last month, there, there was that instant click between Ryan Poles and Caleb Williams because I think they they both share that that chilled out confidence and that cutthroat competitiveness that's that's you know combined in a very unique way. Uh, that's all growing here. And it, when you hear the Bears start to message all the things they love about Caleb Williams, it only leads you to one conclusion that it's going to take three minutes on April 25th for them to turn in that card, have Roger Goodell announce the name and then pivot into this new future. There, there's been nothing in the last week and a half to suggest, Oh boy, they found some concerns and they're thinking about moving in a different direction. Everything has been um, messaged in a way that says we love the kid. We hope he loves us and we hope we can take this into the next generation. I, you know, today we're sitting down uh, with George McCaskey for a group session late in the afternoon. And, and, you know, we see things popping up on social media that Ryan pulls us down the hall on the Pat McAfee show down here, expressing even more heartfelt sentiments that Caleb Williams is the guy that's going to take the bears to new heights. And so um, look like the conclusion that we drew weeks and months ago, it certainly seems like it is now being written in Sharpie. Listen, good for Ryan pulls too, going on the Pat McAfee show and saying he was pissed off <laughs> at RG three. So he, I wasn't the only one to go off on RG three. I'm sure other people did too, but it's good to hear Ryan pulls not hold back and saying that really, how he felt about the suggestion that Caleb Williams was going to pull an Eli Manning and all that nonsense that RG3 used to get noticed. So good for him. Yeah. That was really relevant stuff. So in, in the other part of this, which is really interesting, and I, we'll have some more audio from my sit down with Ryan Poles next week when we have a chance to kind of filter through it and, and talk about it more at length. But one of the things that he's brought up repeatedly over the last couple months is that the attempts and the efforts by the Chicago Bears to dive down into the person of who Caleb Williams is has been centered a lot on how does this person handle adversity? How does he handle pressure? And Ryan has always qualified it by saying, how does he handle pressure in our city or our market or in this particular environment? And I think that's notable because I think the city of Chicago and the Bears fan base is a character in this story in a lot of ways. And the Bears are aware of that. And I think they're healthily aware of that in a way where they understand that, like, look, like we've got to find a way to protect the young quarterback from the noise, to get him to understand how to deal with it, to, to do so. There were some really interesting comments in my one-on-one -on -one session with Ryan Poles about that, about trying to bring that along. And then Matt Eberflus dropped a little nugget in at the coach's breakfast this morning saying that some of the conversations he's had with Shane Waldron has been centered around leadership development of the next Bears quarterback in a way where, where they're very understanding that, like, we can't just try to develop a player here. We've got to, you know, develop – the core leader of our entire locker room at the same time simultaneously so that this guy becomes the battery pack that not only is the engine of what makes the success go on the field, but is, but is the leader, you know, is the guy is the Patrick Mahomes type that, that, that everyone wants to be around and, and, and play with and, and follow. And so that that's going to be really interesting to see how they handle that part of the development. The medical exam will take place at House Hall. That might be the only thing that's preventing the Bears from being more, even more forthcoming <laughs> about their intentions because you don't want to get Ogunjobied, as I referred to it. You don't want to be surprised by a physical. So that will take place whenever he visits Lake Forest. Right. And and look, like Ryan Poles was very adamant in saying, look, like we've looked through the injury history from his whole career, high school, college, at one hamstring injury in college that he played through. And so they're not expecting – uh, anything surprising to pop up on there. Ryan was also forthright in saying, look, like when he leaves Orlando, it's right across the, the way to Louisiana. They will go to Jaden Daniels' pro day. Uh, they will continue the evaluation process in a way that is informative and comprehensive. I don't expect that to change their mind <laughs> in any way, shape, or form, but I am glad that they're doing the homework. It also doesn't hurt to go to LSU's pro day and see if Malik Neighbors is hanging around to be able to, to figure out if, if you can get some time with him, who, by the way, is a, uh, a, a call of duty 
uh, gaming partner with Caleb Williams. They've, they've met each other through the, through the gaming world, and, and maybe soon they can be playing those games in the Players Lounge at Hells Hall. Uh, Malik Neighbors and <laughs> Caleb Williams are, are Call of Duty partners? Is yeah, it, they have a, yeah, they both play Call of Duty, and that's how they, their connection began. Isn't Malik Neighbors, isn't he the one who had the gun charge from in New Orleans? Is that something that, um, is that ring a bell? Uh, we'd have to check into that. That may be that may be something that's that's lingering out there. Yeah, that might not be something that um, I would necessarily. But hey, w- they need to go check it out because you have to find out exactly who it, Malik Neighbors also could not be might not be there at nine. If he's well, at, so it, if he is, then there could be an issue. You're right, and but but that's another topic that you know Ryan and Matt both sort of lit up. Uh, when they were asked about the number nine pick, because I think there's great excitement in the building about what that pick provides the Bears the opportunity to do. Matt said, if we stay at nine, we're certain to get a blue player, which is the color code for the highest impact player uh, that that you can get in a draft. Uh, Ryan understands that like you have an opportunity to pick your flavor, you know, whether you want a receiver, whether you want an offensive tackle, whether you want a pass rusher, whether you want to possibly trade down. I think he also was very, um, amenable to the idea of if a team wants to come up to nine and we've got six or seven players there that we feel really good about. Yeah. Let's go get another pick and grab one of these guys. There's options there. Matt said something today that was interesting. He said, it's all about supporting the quarterback or affecting the quarterback. And so we've got to find somebody there that does one of those two things. Um, You know, that, that, that does leave every offensive tackle, every receiver and every pass rusher on the board for them there. So uh, we'll see where they go, but I think we're starting now with three weeks plus to go before the draft to, 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 to put more focus on that number nine pick. Yeah. Malik neighbors was arrested in um, February, 2023 for carrying a gun um, uh, at Mardi Gras, uh, carrying an illegal weapon. He won't face a misdemeanor charge following his arrest. According to um, ESPN last month, court records indicate that he was arrested. I don't want to get too caught up on that, but let's hope that they just keep that as a virtual thing. If he and Caleb Williams are <laughs> having any sort of gunplay, do, do, okay. do, do you have a lean at number nine right now? Like ideal world, do you have a lean on where you? Um, go? If 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 the left tackle is there, Joe Alt, then I think that you almost have to take him, and I would be surprised if the Bears didn't take him. I also say that I'm hedging my bets because I, I have gone back and forth. If Roma Dunze is there, I like the idea of a rookie quarterback and a rookie wide receiver growing together. And no disrespect to Keenan Allen or DJ Moore, but that could be a very dynamic duo uh, for years to come on the same clock with the same symmetry. So I would probably say I would expect Ryan Poles to take Joe Alt if he's there. But I would probably pull the trigger. I would probably pull the trigger on Roma Dunze if he's there. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see where that goes. And look, like I think that, that that's going to be a fascinating uh, period of the draft. To kind of where I think everyone now in the league is sort of anticipating that four quarterbacks will be gone by the time the Bears go on the clock at nine, and so that pushes position players right down to you in a way that that you should have pretty firm control of the draft board at that point to do something that that feels best to you and. I think the Bears feel very confident that they handled free agency in a way that gives them that flexibility, um, and we'll see what goes uh, what goes on from there. I also thought it was notable uh, through some reporting here that we did at the owners' meeting this week that that the Bears seemed to be in on Mike Williams before Keenan Allen became available, and so they pivoted off one Chargers receiver for another. And I can't believe the amount of uh, excitement and enthusiasm that they feel that they got that done for a fourth round pick and they added a player of that caliber to the Chicago Bears roster. There's been so much else going on with the Chicago Bears, David, that like the Bears adding a receiver who has more than twice as many career yards as the Bears' all-time leader at the position <laughs> it was like the seventh most notable development of the month, and we've barely talked about it. And in most years, it would have been like, holy crap, they got Keenan Allen. That's a good pivot from Mike Williams to Keenan Allen. It's just because you're going to have a young quarterback that needs developing. The other two football nuggets I wanted to get to before we wrap things up in a little bit is that Number one, the secondary gathering together. Apparently, the, uh, uh, Jaquan Brisker is organizing a good secondary uh, bonding session, uh, from what I understand. And secondly, Dan, we talked about this on the Mullen Hall briefly. They have identified, basically, or believe in Tyson Bajan as the number one, number two quarterback. So Tyson Bajan, QB2, is something they feel pretty comfortable with uh, at Hallis Hall. Yeah, I thought that was uh... – 
something worth noting, you know, like that, that, that seems to be the direction they're going. Um, Brett Rippon is, is here as a guy that can be a, uh, knowledgeable offensive tutor and answer questions in the room as the system's being installed and, and it has some ex- a little bit of experience with Shane Waldron. Um, the, the Bears also hired Ryan Griffin to be an offensive assistant who will spend a lot of time with the quarterbacks. And that is a name that a lot of people may not know, but he was a, a player not too long ago, spent some time with the Buccaneers while Tom Brady was there. And so uh, in an assistant coach role, he may take on that that veteran, younger mentor type role that will be able to help Caleb Williams or whatever quarterback may be there um, to, to, to help himself along the developmental process. So was, wasn't Ryan Griffin a former tight end? T- different, different Ryan Griffins. Oh, different, okay. Two different Ryan Griffins. Yeah. Believe me. It's spelled the same different guys. Uh, yeah. Ryan Griffin was a tight end for the bears in 2022. Different Ryan Griffin. This is the quarterback Ryan Griffin. I'm waving to the guys in the background. Those kids in the background want to be on your little <laughs> podcast. Hey, guys, welcome to Take the North. Um, all right, they're in there having a good time. They look like uh, – This is what you get here in the hallway. I get the, it. Uh, I, I think I, I, I applaud your resourcefulness because I know how it gets. Uh, last thing, Dan, I have, and then you can wrap things up with any sort of tidbits that we overlook. We'll get to the rules changes and implications another time because I think there's so much else to cover now because I think those are very interesting. I don't want to dismiss that. But George McCaskey – Big fat no to hard knocks again. <laughs> Why? We we uh, we talked to Kevin Warren early this morning, and when we pushed him, and I kind of pushed his buttons on the hard knocks thing, it, it didn't feel like a hard no. It felt like maybe the door was open, and so it was imperative then that we followed up with George McCaskey in our session with him, and he gave it the hard no, like a really hard no, and said it's our understanding that uh, there are other teams interested in doing it, and we welcome their interest, which is the, the very George way of handling that and putting on the stop sign. Um, look, like I, I think over time the Bears will have their own ways of, of peddling out the behind-the-curtain content that Hard Knocks has become so known for. Uh, I had hoped this morning that maybe they were going to be chosen, and then George put a, a hard stop to that this afternoon. And <laughs> those are the things we learned down here. And uh, so, so people that were holding out hope for that uh, will be disappoint- disappointed. Quickly, at the social function on Monday night, did George McCaskey not tell you that he liked it better when he was having drinks with <laughs> reporters and he dreaded the formal interview process? Was that the, the he gist? Calls, he calls the reception at the owners' meetings that includes both media and um, all the, the team personnel one of his favorite nights of the year. And then he calls the next afternoon when he has to sit with us in an on-the-record session uh, in a group his least favorite day of the year. He does it all in good fun. He does it with, with love to us in the media um, always good to catch George at that at that social function. He's always I- I- incredibly loose, incredibly amusing and entertaining. Uh, and then he was uh, even amusing uh, when we got him this afternoon. Colleen Kane and I sat with him for a two-on-one later, David. And and in dis- expressing his excitement for what this offseason has been, he said, well, you know, the offseason is usually boring. What do we have to, to, to pay attention to, college basketball? And we said, George, this isn't the week to sit with two graduates of the University of Illinois and poo-poo college oh, basketball God. here. Oh, and my so gosh. We, we had to go back and forth on that. And then when we walked out of that session, just so you know, George walked down the hall to one of the grand pianos that's in one of these giant hallways here uh, between the JW Marriott and the Ritz-Carlton, and he played Bear Down on the piano. Like it was <laughs> one of those moments. He did not. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. It was really impressive. We were about 100 yards away. We're like, wait a second. Did George just stop to play Bear Down on the piano? Sure enough, he did. Brandon Faber, their uh, PR director, gave us the thumbs up. And that, that was that was the scene. And that's George, right? Like, Was there anybody George. else in the hallway? He just stopped in, a, in, a, in the middle of the hallway and played Bear Down on the piano? Yeah, handful of people. Not, nobody that uh, probably recognized him. But he was uh, by himself, walking by himself with, with, with Brandon. Brandon Faber. Yeah, yeah. With Brandon Faber. Yeah, yeah. And just, oh, my God. That's... The moment captured him. You know, all, all that was missing was his brother, Pat, to sing along. <laughs> so, some good, probably with some improvised lyrics, if we know Pat, right? Now, that would be a nightclub act at the uh, Bears uh, Palooza or wherever they put uh, the hotel along the lakefront, perhaps. They could have the evening entertainment being the McCaskey brothers. No question about it. Dave, this event provides such a – I mean, like, again, like I said at the outset, it's such a good setting, but it's also just a flood – of content and like I, I i've got stuff for our show for weeks once we get a chance to, to take a breath and, and sift through it so so be ready because i think there was some really good 
stuff on a number of fronts from from Ryan uh, and George and Kevin that that we can uh, that we can put forth and, and kind of discuss further because it's really good to get the insight and the expertise from the people that are currently running the Bears at a time where the Bears need to be run. <laughs> well, we called on. it one of the most significant off seasons in team history, and it certainly to this point has delivered plenty of content and reasons to understand that that's actually happening. And uh, one news story after another, we'll continue to bring you all of the insight here on the Take the North podcast. Dan, I think that um, that kind of wraps up, unless I'm missing something. Anything else you want to add? No, not for now. Uh, I'm going to go on spring break for a few days. So uh, you, you, you got the, the steering wheel of the podcast until I'm done spring breaking. Uh, but it's been it's been great. And uh, look like we're, we're we're crossing out of a, a month that was super busy and eventful. And we're going into another month where I think there's going to be some landmark things, whether it be the stadium or the number one pick or the number nine pick or some surprise twists along the way. Like so don't 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 uh, close your eyes for long because it feels like there's something around every turn with this team. Great job down there and all month long. I will drop an episode later this week on either a mailbag or whatever develops coming out of the owners meetings, looking for a special guest, have some ideas, but we'll wait and see. So uh, that's, that's a, that's a nice job. Good information. I hope the Illini um, for your sake, win a game, but then they have big Yukon on the other end of the bracket. So I don't know. Couldn't bring them on. Bring them yeah, on. Bring it's them that on. time okay. of year. Bring them on. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, let's go. Northwestern couldn't hold up to them. Let's go. Let's see. Be careful let's, what let, you wish for. Let's All see. right. No, for, I wish for it. <laughs> for, for Doug Altenberger um, and Adam Stadzinski, for Dan Weeder from the Chicago Tribune, I'm David Haw. Thank you for listening to the Take the North podcast. You can get us on your free Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast, and you can watch us on 670 Scores YouTube page. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening. Great talk. See you out there.